Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, Tulsa's source for great gardens. SouthwoodGardenCenter.com and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. We are behind the scenes planning for next season. In the meantime, we hope you enjoy some of our favorite shows from this last year. On today's program, we clean out bird feeders and get them ready for action. Host Casey Hinches plants some bare root trees in our orchard. We look at a nasty pest that is affecting crepe myrtles. And we have tips to keep your trees well watered until we get spring rains. A lot of times we get distracted with our plants in the summertime and start thinking about the birds come wintertime. We're going to look at how to clean those bird feeders and get them ready for our feathered friends. Now hanging bird feeders, you should be cleaning these every other week in the summer months, but in case you haven't, we're going to do that now. And so what you want to do in order to do that is to go ahead and kind of disassemble any pieces that might be on it. We of course have our um, squirrel cage on this and so we're going to take this apart and it's in here with a little bit of a pin. So now that we've got our bird feeder disassembled a little bit um, you can see that this is kind of rusting a bit and coming off on our hands so we are going to paint this a little bit later but first we want to make sure that we clean it thoroughly. In order to do this we're going to need uh, a solution of four parts of water to one part of vinegar. So we've got about eight of our measuring cup in here of water and we're going to add two cups of vinegar to this mixture. Now that we've got our mixture made, we're going to use this mixture to really scrub and clean any of this. And this is just a bottle brush. You can find these at your local store um, and scrub off all of that old bird seed that might be on there, any bird droppings that might be on there. We just want to make sure that we get it all clean. And we are going to actually let this soak for a while. So if it's not coming off right away, after it soaks, it should be removed pretty easily. On this, we want to make sure to move our, remove our peg out of there so we can get our bottle brush in there. So we're going to remove that peg and then just sink this whole thing down in there. And again, using your bottle brush to scrub the outside of it pretty thoroughly especially around where the birds eat and also the posts that they roost on. Depending on which sort of bottle brush you get, sometimes they come with a little small one. And so those work well to get in and around those smaller spaces. So we've got most of the big stuff off. We're just going to let this soak for a little bit longer and then we'll come back to it and clean it up. In the meantime, we've got another feeder over here um, that doesn't need to go back out, but we need to get it prepared for storage for the winter time. You probably have some hummingbird feeders that have been out. All the hummingbirds have left our garden at this point um, and we won't need these back out until next spring. So hummingbird feeders, you really should be cleaning these every time you refill them with your sugar solution. Um, in case 
you haven't or you just need to clean it again before you store it, we're going to disassemble it as well. And for this, you can use your one part vinegar to four parts water solution again. Um, but we're going to use actually a bleach solution where we use one part bleach to nine parts water. And that's because we've got some mold that's starting to come into this at this point. So we want to make sure that it's nice and clean for winter time um, before we put it away. So we've completely taken it apart and we're going to soak this in uh, water and bleach. Now we have nine parts of water in here already. So we're going to add our one part bleach. And now that we have that in here, we're going to use this to clean off, see how moldy it is right there. So we're going to use this bleach solution and again our bottle brush to go ahead and clean that out. Now some people do use soap to clean their hummingbird feeders, but that's really not recommended um, because soap can leave a residue behind that is toxic to birds. And so if you do use soap, you only want to use a small amount of soap. We're going to use our bottle brush again to really get the inside of that clean because that's where that sugar has been. And a lot of times it can turn uh, rancid and, and sour pretty quickly being out in the sun. We're going to let that again set in there for a while and go ahead and start cleaning some of the other pieces. You can see on this one, the top has a lot of seed debris in there. So we want to just go ahead and get all of that out, kind of tap it on something. Again, this is where those little brushes or a toothbrush comes in handy to really clean that out. All right, so it's looking pretty good. Again, we'll just let that soak. So this is the reservoir that holds our nectar and a lot of times this is what gets really gunky and usually they will pop apart. We can take the top of ours off here and look at that. You can see all of that and ants in there because of course ants like sugar. So we're just going to dump this over to the side and set this in here. So again, you can let this soak for a little bit if you need to, um, but we've got ours pretty well cleaned off. So whenever you use bleach, um, it's ideal to go ahead and boil them, to rinse them afterwards, but you want to make sure and check your manufacturer's um, label as to whether you can do that with your bird feeder or not. If you can't, you just want to make sure to rinse it thoroughly. So that's what we're going to do with our stuff here. So we're just going to lay our stuff out here and wash it outside on the, with the garden hose. So now that we've got these rinsed off, we're just going to go ahead and lay these out and make sure that they dry thoroughly and then we'll reassemble them and go ahead and put them up for winter storage. We want to then check back on our other hanging bird feeder here. And now that it's nice and soaked for a while, we're going to pull it out and rinse it off also. We're then going to let it dry for a while. We will spray paint it and freshen it up to go back out for winter. When you purchase a tree, typically it's packaged in one of three ways. It may come bald and burlapped, which means that it has been grown out in a field, dug up out of that field, and the root ball has been wrapped in burlap, and then usually it's contained inside of a wire basket, or it might just be wrapped in twine. This is often referred to as B&B &B also. You might buy a containerized tree, which means the tree has been grown in a container and upsized as it needed to be. 
Now these containers can be either fabric or plastic, but they contain a whole root system of that tree. You may also buy a bare root tree, and these don't come with any packaging other than something, some material to keep the moisture around those roots, but it doesn't come with any soil. A lot of times when we buy trees online, especially in late winter, we might get a bare root tree. Today we have a bare root tree and this is what we're going to look at planting. Um, a lot of times when we talk about bare root trees, we tend to think about fruit trees. Now you can buy fruit trees at most nurseries um, and those will probably likely be containerized trees. If you're not finding the correct selection that you're looking for, then you might turn to the internet and again, it will likely come as a bare root tree. Now there's pros and cons to all of these. Um, obviously, if you're buying online, you don't want the weight of the soil, so that's one of the nice benefits of bare root trees. We've bought some for our new orchard that we're establishing outside our vegetable garden here. And when you get this package in the mail, you wanna make sure you open it right away. You know how you feel after you've been traveling and that's not in the cargo hold. So we wanna inspect these and make sure that they don't have any damage to them. Um, if they do, you obviously wanna contact your supplier right away. Now this looks good and everything and so because they've been out of water for quite a while, we want to make sure to rehydrate them before we plant them. So you'll want to soak those roots for about an hour or two prior to planting. You never want to soak them for more than 24 hours because that can cause some damage to them. Now when we plant, we're simply going to start digging our hole. Like I said, it's a smaller tree so we don't have to dig quite such a big hole though. Now that we have our tree hole ready for planting, you can see that this is deep enough and it's just as wide. Um, we want to make sure that we try to plant it at the same level that you can see the color change. Now obviously the roots have been wet, but you can see the root flare here and where the stems start right there. So we're going to make sure to get it at that same level. One area that you want to make sure never to bury is this graft union right here. Fruit trees are a lot of times grafted trees, and this particular one that we've purchased here is a Bradley nectarine tree. Bradley uh, is actually a selection that's a cross between an Arkansas peach and an Arkansas nectarine selection. The Bradley nectarine is known for having attractive, firm fruit, and so that's why we like this cultivar. However, a lot of times fruit trees, the rootstock might not be as desirable. In this instance, it is on Lovell rootstock, which is a little bit more cold hardy and also is more tolerant of wet soils, which is ideal for our Oklahoma clay soils. So again, this is where the graft is, and this is the Lovell rootstock, and then above this is the Bradley uh, cultivar, which will give us that nice produce. So we wanna make sure not to cover that up ever. And so we will then just backfill this with our native soil that we've already excavated from this hole and that way the tree goes ahead and gets adjusted to the soil that it will be growing in. If you put good soil in here then it might be that that root system stays in that good soil and doesn't branch out whereas we want those roots to really grow out. So as I said, we want to backfill with native soil and sometimes that can be a little chunky or, or make blocks basically. And so you want to break those up with your hands so that it's a finer texture to get down in between the roots. And we don't want to push too much because we don't want to break those fragile roots as we're pushing that soil down on top of them. So you want to make sure to create kind of a well around the tree so that it creates a, re a reservoir for that water to percolate down over those roots. And then of course, to help preserve that moisture in the soil, we're going to add some mulch around that new tree. And then of course we always want to make sure that we label any new plant that we put in here. Um, you can see we've got quite a tree ring around this established and we're gonna put more mulch in here. But if you're putting this out in your lawn, you wanna make sure that you have a significant tree ring to protect it from a weed eater or any lawnmower or anything like that. 
Now the last thing that we're going to do, and you want to make sure to read your care instructions that come along with your tree, um, because there might be some pruning that you need to do. In our particular situation here, this tree has not been topped or anything, and so we do need to prune it. Now, I know this looks drastic, but we actually are going to want to cut this back to about 18 to 24 inches. And that's because as a fruit tree, you want that branch scaffolding to be much lower. It'll make maintenance and harvesting of your fruit much easier later on as those branches continue to grow. Otherwise, they might be up a little bit too high out of your reach. So here, we're gonna measure about 18 inches, which is just right about here. So we are going to actually cut off all of this. We're going to find a bud and there's a bud right there. So we're going to cut right above that bud. So now I know we've just taken off half of this tree and you feel like you've paid for half of this, but this is really the best situation for this tree and it's important. Some trees will already come with their top cut, so it might be shipped to you like this. And what's gonna happen is all of these small buds are gonna push out and come out this spring. And so you'll have your branching starting at this height here. This will make for a great tree as it continues to grow. We will check back on it as we prune it even more because it tends to need a series of pruning each year. While it might look drastic, this is tough love on a fruit tree and I promise it'll make for a great orchard in years to come. Many people often ask, when is the best time to prune your crepe myrtle? Well, when you're looking at pruning shrubs, there's something you need to find out first and that's whether the shrub blooms on old wood or new wood. Behind us here, we have a plant that blooms on old wood. This is a forsythia. And now a lot of our early springtime blooming shrubs do bloom on old wood. And this, like quince and some of your hydrangeas, are examples of those shrubs that bloom on old wood. You can see here the flower buds were already developed last season, and that's why they're ready to go first thing in the spring before any leaves start coming out. If we had pruned this before it bloomed, we would be cutting off those flowers. The best time to prune a plant that blooms on old wood is right after it's done flowering. Now, cray myrtles, they bloom on new wood. You can see here in late winter, early spring, that our cray myrtle has not started coming out of dormancy yet. There are no flowers and no leaves, unlike some of our spring blooming shrubs. This one blooms a little later in the season, and as we stated, it does bloom on new wood. So what it's actually gonna do is start producing some new shoots and some new leaves before it develops those flower buds. Now for shrubs that bloom on new wood, the best time to prune them is prior to their new growth. So right now is when we're gonna take a look at this and start pruning it. And anytime you prune anything, you wanna make sure that you remove any dead, diseased, or crossing and rubbing branches first. Now, here you can see a couple of branches that are crossing one another, and they're actually rubbing and bruising each other on the sides of them. So we're gonna go ahead and take one of those out. Now, how do you determine which of the rubbing branches to remove? Well, again, looking at this, we're going to remove the one that is growing more towards the center of the canopy. This one is growing outward, and so that's the one that we're gonna keep. We've got a nice sharp pair of loppers here, and we're gonna try to get down as low as possible on that stem and remove that branch. A lot of times you'll have some of these lower branches that have been removed earlier, but you wanna go ahead and take those down as much as possible too, because that just creates dead wood that might harbor potential diseases and insects. Now on this same branch that uh, you can see where it was rubbing, we also have a dead stem here. So we're just gonna take our pruners and go ahead and cut that out. 
you'll see we also have another little stem here. And this just is kind of gonna be some weak growth. It's not really gonna add anything. What we're looking for is a mature plant that's gonna have these beautiful large stems. And so this one we're gonna go ahead and take out as well. And you can see how that opens up the interior here a little bit more. Again, allowing for good airflow. So we're just gonna continue this around the plant. Again, making sure that we are making the proper cuts. You don't ever wanna uh, get step back and look and see that you've pruned one side too much and the other side is lopsided then. Now that we've pretty much finished pruning this one, um, you can see how it's got a nice vase shape to it. It's got an open interior to allow for good airflow. And you can see we took a little bit off, but not too much. You never want to prune more than a third of the plant away. In this way, it still has plenty of vegetation once it starts coming out of dormancy to establish more growth. Now, this is not a mature plant just yet, so we'll need to continue to do this. And of course, if you ever see any suckers or small shoots starting to come from the roots, you want to make sure to trim those back as well, because we just want to maintain these trunks that are here now. Now behind us we have one more uh, crepe myrtle that's a little bit larger. You can see it's almost mature and how beautiful this bark is starting to establish itself. Um, as they get bigger you're going to want to just to continue to prune these lower branches up so that you can keep that lifted and see the trunks below it. And the last thing a lot of people ask about are these dried seed heads that are from last season. Now, if they do bother you because they will maintain there as the new growth is coming out um, and they tend to make it look a little bit dried um, and dead looking. So what you can do is just get some leather gloves and easily strip them like that. But there's no reason to really go through and prune anything. It's more of an aesthetic thing. So uh, here we have some that are much taller than what we can reach and you'd have to get on a ladder. And so we're just gonna leave them and the vegetation will soon cover those dried seeds over. Now, if you're new to pruning, I have to say crepe myrtles are a pretty good plant to start practicing on. You probably have seen some that have been what we call crepe murdered, where they've just been cut off with a chainsaw and those knuckles start to develop. And that's not the best way to prune a crepe myrtle at all. In fact, what you're doing is slowly killing that crepe myrtle. But as evident by some of the poor pruning jobs that are around, you can see that it's pretty difficult to kill a crepe myrtle and it's not going to happen anytime soon. But really, this is the best way to maintain that natural, healthy crepe myrtle shape. We've been talking a lot about the importance of watering trees, especially in the wintertime when we haven't had much rainfall. Well, I want to show you a little bit of a tool that might be helpful for you. You might remember we just recently planted a nectarine tree, and what we have here is called a tree gator. Now, this is a woven plastic that we will lay around the base of this tree here. And this one's the low profile tree gator and it's suitable for putting underneath low branching evergreens um, or other shrubs but in this situation we're going to use it around our nectarine because the stem's not very strong yet. What you'll do is you'll fill this up with a hose and it contains about 15 gallons worth of water. By watering with this you'll know exactly how much water you're putting on your tree. When we're out hand watering, a lot of times we think we might have been standing there for quite a while, when in reality we haven't been standing out there for that long. Or when we're watering, the water is actually running off rather than going down into that tree root ball that needs that water. This allows us to fill it up, gives it 15 gallons of water, and we know that it's slowly going to percolate down into that root ball. You can see here on the back side, that it has these little valves that allows that water to percolate down into that root zone. Now, this is one style. There is another style that is more of a tent-like style that leans on the trunk of the tree. And that's more appropriate for larger trees. It also contains 15 gallons of water when you fill it up. And you would wanna fill these up about once or twice a week, depending on the time of the year. 
Now this is great for this time of year when we're not getting a lot of rainfall, but I would suggest that come spring you remove these because while they are porous when they're filled up with water, when we have heavy rainfalls, they tend to act like a rain coat and they prevent that water from getting down into the ground below it. So even though we might have gotten rain, you might think your tree's gotten moisture, it might not have. So take these off when the spring rains start coming and then put them back on in the summertime. One of the nice things about the tent gator bag is that if you have a very large tree, you can actually zip multiple bags together in order to provide it with more water. Depending on how often you fill these up after they drain out, a lot of times they'll just be laying there, which serve as a nice visual reminder for you to water your trees. Next week, we'll be back with an all new episode of Oklahoma Gardening to start the new growing season. We have a great year planned, so be sure and tune in because you won't want to miss all of the new TV you'll grow to love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We wish to thank our generous underwriters, Southwood Landscape and Garden Center, and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is provided by Pond Pro Shops, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, and the Oklahoma Horticultural Society. Hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.